Hello, and welcome back to our Ancient and Medieval World video lecture series. Our new topic is Early Medieval Europe, uh, and especially the Germanic kingdoms that emerged in Western Europe after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. We're going to focus especially on uh, the Kingdom of France, uh, that is the territory that was once known as Gaul, a uh, province of the Roman Empire, uh, which in the 300s was invaded by a tribe called the Franks. Uh, the Franks give their name to the entire country uh, that they seize and settle. Uh, and they uh, become one of the greatest powers of early medieval Europe. We're going to focus on a few moments in Frankish history uh, and think about the development of France uh, as a medieval European power. In the early 500s CE, the Franks unify uh, and take over all of the territory uh, of modern day France under the leadership of a warrior king named Clovis, uh, who famously converts to Catholic Christianity. Uh, in the 700s, two centuries uh, and a half after Clovis's reign, uh, the Franks uh, expand beyond their borders and uh, build an empire that stretches down to include Italy uh, and east uh, across Germany and uh, parts of Eastern Europe. This is led by a Frankish king named Karl, uh, Charles, uh, or in Latin, Carolus. Uh, because of his success as an imperial builder, uh, he becomes known as Karl or Charles the Great, uh, in French, Charlemagne. Uh, and he gives his Latin name to the Frankish Empire that he rules, uh, which is known as the Carolingian Empire, the Empire of Charles. Uh, Charles is a remarkable ruler. He builds up the Carolingian Frankish Empire uh, to be a successor state to Rome. Uh, he gains the title of Emperor of the Romans, granted to him by the Pope in Rome uh, in the year 800. But Charles's empire is based on his own charismatic personality, uh, and it will not last long as a united centralized force uh, after Charles dies in the year 814. Instead, it would split into multiple competing kingdoms, uh, a Frankish or French half in the west, uh, a territory in the Rhine River Valley in the center, uh, and a kingdom of Germany in the east, uh, which later takes on the title uh, of the Holy Roman Empire. So today we're going to think uh, about some of the key events in uh, that rise and fall of a, a Frankish empire. Uh, we'll think about why it splits up into multiple European kingdoms uh, and what are the problems that beset uh, the French half after the split. Uh, at the end of class, we'll think a little bit about the famous Vikings, the Scandinavian raiders who terrorize uh, as well as settling and trading uh, in parts of Europe uh, in the 800s and early 900s CE. So we have to start by envisioning Western Europe after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, the cities of Western Europe are, are substantially depopulated uh, due to uh, a series of catastrophes in the 400s CE uh, and the 500s. Uh, there are epidemic diseases, uh, there are migrating tribes uh, attacking urban centers uh, and looting them. Rome itself was sacked twice by the Goths and then by the Vandals uh, in the 400s. Uh, a wider percentage of the population uh, moved out into the countryside. Uh, and the early Middle Ages from the 400s through the 600s uh, are a time of uh, extreme economic difficulty. Uh, deprivation, and a, a population that leaves cities and, and really scatters uh, into small farms. Leadership in different parts of Western Europe is taken over by Germanic tribal kings, uh, but they attempt to compete with each other and raise their status with their followers, uh, and they try to get loyalty and food supplies uh, from surviving uh, Roman populations. Uh, by trying to describe their uh, titles, their leadership in Roman terms. Uh, very often, they will take the title 
of dux or comes, that is duke or count. Uh, those are Latin titles for military commanders in the late Roman Imperial Army. Uh, but now they start to become uh, the titles of a new German territorial nobility uh, that is taking over those old Roman army roles. The most important holdover from the Roman Empire uh, is the Christian church. The church had established itself uh, in the major cities of the Roman Empire. It had organized itself into dioceses that mimicked the territorial uh, organization of the Roman Empire. Uh, and the church remains as Roman secular authority and bureaucratic authority breaks down. Uh, in the early Germanic kingdoms, the leadership is largely illiterate, uh, but they look uh, to try to present themselves as Roman-style leaders uh, in order to elevate themselves above their followers uh, and get loyalty from the population that they're taking over. So they offer uh, localized deals to Christian church leaders, uh, and this happens in many parts of Western Europe uh, as the Roman Empire fades away in the West. Uh, church leaders maintain uh, their social prestige and their urban bases. Uh, they continue trying to take care uh, of the urban populations uh, left over from the Roman cities. Uh, some church leaders are trying to establish early monasteries in the countryside uh, and begin more conversion and outreach uh, to peasants who, who are largely still uh, non-Christian. But the church uh, starts to provide advice uh, and support uh, for German kings who promise to protect the church and uh, its followers and its resources in return. Uh, and so you see an increasing identification uh, between German tribal kings claiming to be Roman-style generals uh, and uh, church leaders, uh, bishops and abbots, uh, who tell their followers to give loyalty to these local German lords. This is the situation uh, in France uh, in the 400s and 500s, uh, when you start to get uh, the takeover and unification under this new Frankish royal family. Uh, there were many different Frankish tribal chiefs uh, who came down and settled in, in uh, different parts of Roman France. Uh, but one of the most important was uh, this man named Clovis. Uh, who was at the height of his power uh, in the 490s and the early 500s. Uh, Clovis is someone who rises to power and who unifies Frankish territories uh, by fighting against and defeating and killing rival Frankish leaders. Uh, he is himself a terrifying warrior figure. Uh, he is someone who uh, leads through a combination of warrior charisma uh, and the ability to intimidate his followers. Uh, at an early period, Clovis begins to see the advantage in alliance uh, with Christian church leaders. Uh, even before he converts to Christianity, he starts trying to represent himself as a protector of the church, uh, which in turn can give him a greater outreach uh, to the subjects uh, that he hopes to control. There's a famous story uh, about Clovis that's told by one of the main sources from this period, uh, a Frankish bishop named Gregory of Tours, who, who wrote a history of the early Frankish kings. Uh, Gregory tells us that a band of Clovis's warriors uh, happened to raid a monastery near the city of Soissons uh, without Clovis's permission. Uh, and they brought back loot to Clovis's drinking hall. Uh, the king of a Frankish tribe was expected to uh, show off his authority among his warriors through feasting. Uh, and at this particular feast, Clovis is drinking with his followers. Uh, they're displaying their loot when a monk from the local Christian church uh, comes and, and begs admittance. Clovis says, okay, let's let the monk in and, and hear what he has to say. Uh, and the monk came before Clovis uh, and humbly asked him if he could please have some of the treasure back from uh, their looted church. Uh, he understands that Clovis is a just leader, uh, that he wants to protect Christians, and the church had a, a particular treasure, a holy chalice, uh, that was uh, their prized possession for saying Christian Mass. 
uh, and it would mean so much to them if Clovis could see it in his heart to return it. So Clovis turned to his warriors and asked, who has the chalice? Whoever has the chalice, give it back to the nice monk. Uh, one of his warriors took the cup out of his sack, this chalice, uh, and Clovis said, yes. The monk asked very nicely, I'm telling you as your king, give it back. And the warrior responds, you can't make me. I'm a tough German warrior. What are you going to do? Uh, Clovis shouted at him, give back the cup to the nice monk. Uh, and the warrior picked up his axe, smashed the cup into pieces on the table uh, and said, oops, I can't give it back. Clovis's authority is challenged. He has to make a, a judgment call. Uh, if he backs down before this follower, he loses prestige. Uh, he loses face before his warriors. So he asked the monk to go home. Uh, he told his warriors to forget about the quarrel. For the time being, uh, he bides his time, lets everyone drink and be merry. But a short time later, Clovis calls a parade to review all his warriors and their equipment. He walks down the line of his warriors standing there on parade, uh, inspects their axes and their spears, makes sure that they're up to snuff. Uh, and finally, he comes to the man who had insulted him uh, and destroyed the holy cup. And when he looks at this warrior, uh, he tells him, your boots are dirty. The warrior looks down and Clovis takes his own battle axe and splits him in half from uh, head down. Uh, and at this point, he shouts to his warriors, he destroyed the cup. I have destroyed him in the same way. And he sends news to the local church that the loss of the cup has been avenged. This is a great story. It may be apocryphal, but it gives uh, a sense of the sort of leadership uh, and, and you know, personal violent display uh, that goes on in the early Frankish state. And Clovis is a leader because he is more terrifying than his followers. So when Clovis converts to Christianity, he does this to try to gain the stronger support of the church across all of the territory of France uh, for his realm. He claims uh, that he is inspired uh, by a vision of Jesus that comes to him in battle, uh, that he's fighting against another German tribe, the Alemanni, and the Alemanni are winning until Clovis prays to Jesus to help him slaughter his enemies uh, and win the day. And sure enough, the battle turns, uh, and Clovis defeats his enemies, uh, and after this, uh, he accepts the reality of, of Jesus. Uh, of course, this is a far cry from any sort of written Christian theology that one might imagine, uh, but it suffices in Clovis's France. It also may be a deliberate attempt to copy Constantine, uh, the late Roman emperor, uh, to suggest that Clovis is a kind of new Constantine, uh, who just like Constantine won his wars because he has the support of the Almighty. Uh, Clovis then has a mass baptism staged uh, in which he and thousands of his warriors wade into a river in France and are blessed by the Bishop of Reims. Uh, and uh, this is a, a further step in the alliance between church and this very, very formative state uh, in the Frankish world. So Clovis uh, unified France. Um, he ultimately dies uh, of natural causes, uh, leaving this large Frankish territory, but he makes a decision before his death that plunges the Franks back into cycles of repeating violence and civil war. Uh, rather than set up a simple hereditary succession, Clovis follows an old Germanic tradition in which property is divided equally between all of the sons uh, who survive their father. Clovis had four sons, and having unified France, he divided it into four equal kingdoms uh, among them, and then he died. So Clovis's sons turned on each other uh, immediately. They know their father had more power and wealth and prestige than they did. They know they each have a quarter of his kingdom, and they want the whole. They spend a generation battling each other, murdering family members left and right, to try to reunify Clovis's friends. Finally, in the later 500s, 
uh, one of Clovis's sons manages to kill off the others, bring the entire territory together again, uh, and promptly before he dies, divides his kingdom among his four sons. So the cycle continues. The early Frankish kings don't learn the lessons uh, of Clovis uh, and his succession. Uh, and instill, uh, instead, while they continue to work with the Christian church, uh, and while the more successful of them uh, sponsor uh, new Christianization activities, uh, building more monasteries in the countryside, uh, Clovis's Frankish descendants uh, repeatedly battle each other uh, and keep uh, early medieval France in uh, a state of uh, permanent instability. This lasts uh, into the 700s uh, for two centuries uh, until finally the last descendants of Clovis uh, lose power uh, and are overthrown by a new Frankish royal family. Uh, a king called uh, Pepin the Short uh, seizes power and, and sends the last of Clovis's descendants into a monastery uh, in the uh, 750s. Uh, and ultimately, uh, he uh, lays the way for his son, Charles the Great, or Charlemagne, uh, to come to power and, and build a Frankish empire in 768. Now, Charlemagne uh, is a remarkable ruler. Charlemagne has a vision uh, of trying to go beyond the borders of Frank land and trying to build uh, a new version of the Roman Empire. Uh, he expands uh, in all directions, especially across the Alps into Italy uh, and east uh, into Germany uh, and parts of what's now Hungary and the Czech Republic and Poland. Charlemagne organizes uh, his empire uh, along uh, a much more uh, organized line than we had seen in the Frankish kingdoms. Uh, he divides it into hundreds of small regional provinces uh, and appoints counts, uh, a Frankish nobility who he delegates to go out as his deputies uh, and run every one of these provinces. Uh, he communicates with his hundreds of counts by sending out messengers uh, in Latin, missi, uh, who are either uh, counts or, or high-ranking uh, clergy members themselves, uh, and they go on annual inspection tours uh, and make sure that the nobles of Charlemagne are keeping up their loyalty uh, to the king. Charlemagne himself travels between several different German and French cities um, where uh, he sets up temporary capitals, uh, including the city of Aachen uh, in Germany, uh, as well as Paris uh, and other sites. Um, he sponsors uh, church work. Uh, under Charlemagne's reign, there's a sort of uh, flourishing of uh, Christian literature, uh, but also of recopying of ancient Roman uh, Latin classics uh, by church figures uh, who are working to copy out manuscripts in uh, monasteries in order to improve their Latin. Now, above all, uh, Charlemagne builds an empire based on military power, uh, and he tries to show that he will use that military power for the good of the Christian church uh, to forcibly convert areas of Europe that have not yet accepted Christianity. Uh, he brings together an army almost every year and rides out to his frontiers on military campaigns. Uh, his army is made up of uh, mounted warriors uh, fighting with swords and spears from horseback, uh, the beginnings of the knights of medieval Europe. He assembles it every year by asking each one of his counts and churchmen uh, to give him a quota of warriors. Uh, basically, he rewards each one of his key counts and clergymen with grants of land, uh, with estates that are worked by peasants, uh, and those lands uh, produce uh, farm supplies and uh, produce uh, that support uh, a group of warriors and, and horsemen uh, for each one. So every year he gathers together uh, small groups of knights from across his empire, puts them together in one army, uh, and he himself or one of his generals goes out to the frontier uh, and takes the field. He's especially successful uh, in his campaigns into Germany. 
Uh, and there he tries to stamp out the worship of Thor and Odin and other uh, gods uh, of uh, the, the old Norse mythology. Uh, he builds wooden churches uh, and forts to protect the churches. Uh, he engages in uh, compulsory mass baptisms, uh, setting up situations where thousands of uh, German peasants uh, are dragged from their homes, marched into a river, uh, and converted to Christianity. And in several cases, when they revolt, when they attack his soldiers or burn his new churches, he responds with mass hangings, sometimes of hundreds or thousands uh, of people at a time, in order to punish those uh, who are not accepting the new religion. In the year 800, Charlemagne uh, gains the strongest endorsement yet from the Christian church. Uh, in that year, Pope Leo III uh, proclaims Charlemagne the new emperor of the Romans uh, in a high mass on Christmas Day in the city of Rome itself. Uh, Charlemagne had helped Leo III, uh, a pope who had almost been deposed uh, by a rival would-be pope, uh, who had been attacked and uh, uh, had his vision impaired uh, in the uh, attack. Uh, Charlemagne uh, had rescued Pope Leo, brought him back to Rome with his troops, sat him back up in the Vatican. Uh, so this is a thanksgiving offering from Leo, uh, giving Charlemagne the claim to be uh, a new successor to the Roman emperors who hadn't ruled in Rome for the last 400 years. Now, you can imagine who would be angry at this. The Byzantine Empire is directly threatened. Uh, the Byzantine Empire uh, at this point is still battling for its existence against the expanding uh, forces of the Abbasid Caliphs at Baghdad. Uh, the Byzantine emperors claim that they are the only true Roman emperors based in Constantinople. Uh, and they immediately threaten Charlemagne with war. But Charlemagne shows a mastery of international diplomacy uh, that goes uh, beyond the uh, divisions between Christianity and Islam. Faced with war uh, from the Christian Byzantines, Charlemagne, the supposed champion uh, of Christianity, sends an embassy uh, to Baghdad and receives embassies in return from the Caliph uh, of the Arab Empire. Ultimately, Charlemagne and this Arab caliph, Harun al-Rashid, conclude a treaty of alliance and friendship. Uh, and Charlemagne gets a present of an albino elephant, uh, as well as various treasures sent to him uh, by his uh, new Arab partners. The result of this is that the Byzantine Empire can't attack and try to dismantle Charlemagne's Frankish Empire. Uh, and Charlemagne uh, retains prestige and power uh, claiming to be a leader of the Christian world, uh, while also uh, allying for uh, reasons of, of personal security with the leader of the Muslim world. Uh, Charlemagne's reign would come to an end with his death of natural causes in, in the year 814. Uh, and in the aftermath of his reign, his successors lack the ability to keep this large empire together. Uh, instead, Europe would continue the fragmentation that had started before Charlemagne uh, back in the era uh, of the Germanic invasions. The kingdom of Charlemagne within a few decades split into three parts, France in the west, the Rhineland and parts of Italy in the middle, uh, and Germany in the east. Uh, in the 840s uh, and then into the early 900s, uh, the French part of the Frankish Empire uh, was then targeted by repeated raids uh, from the fierce Scandinavian peoples who, who live uh, on its northern borders. Uh, these are the Vikings uh, of world history, uh, pirates from uh, a number of Scandinavian kingdoms who build fleets uh, of fast-moving, uh, shallow-drafted ships that can sail not only uh, the deep ocean, but also upriver valleys. Uh, for decades, after Charlemagne's death, uh, no longer terrified by a, a powerful emperor in Frankland, the Vikings sail around the coasts of France, uh, as well as nearby uh, islands, including Britain and Ireland. Uh, they terrorize the locals, they raid 
Uh, they are less interested in fighting battles uh, than they are in looting churches and monasteries, uh, getting easy treasure, uh, or kidnapping high-profile individuals uh, and gaining ransoms. Uh, ultimately, over time, the, the Viking era is, is short-lived. There's not a Viking empire uh, built. You do get Viking groups settling down uh, in various parts of Europe, uh, in some cases converting to Christianity uh, and founding their own trading uh, duchies or, or kingdoms. Uh, by the early 900s, a group of Vikings have settled down across the northern coast of France, uh, which is named after them, the land of the Northmen, uh, or Normandy. Uh, far to the east, Viking groups uh, have moved through the Baltic Sea and into what becomes uh, the early kingdoms of Russia. Uh, out to the west, uh, Vikings settled in various parts uh, of Britain uh, and found trading cities in, in parts of Ireland. Now in France, uh, the Viking Age is a traumatic one. Uh, the French countryside is, is repeatedly uh, raided and looted. Uh, cities uh, like Paris are, are perpetually under threat from Viking raiders. But gradually, local nobles uh, start to build up more effective anti-Viking defenses, uh, building small local private armies of knights uh, and starting to build stone castles to defend their own small territories uh, within France. Um, there's a royal family at Paris. Uh, after uh, a siege of Paris in the 880s, uh, Charlemagne's descendants are eventually displaced from power, uh, and a new royal family, the Capetians, uh, takes power around the city of Paris. But the royal family lacks the sort of central authority that Charlemagne had briefly wielded, uh, and instead France becomes a country with a uh, figurehead king uh, and with numerous powerful nobles scattered across uh, its more localized territories. When we come back in our next lecture, we'll think about uh, the further developments that take place after the year 900 uh, in Western Europe, uh, and especially the competitions that develop between nobles, kings, uh, and a church that starts to bid for a more powerful leadership in its own right uh, in the 1000s.